Well, please turn your Bibles to Psalm 139. While you're turning there, I want to ask you a question was, was kind of emphasized in that video. And here's the question. Does your life have significance? In other words, does your life have any meaning? Because you think about it, we've all wrestled with that. We all step back and say, does my life really make any difference in the big scheme of things? And I think there's a lot of reasons why we feel that way. And I'll just give you two of the reasons that come to mind. One is how great the world is. You saw in that video, the world is very vast, it's very expansive, and so often we can get lost in it. And in fact, the video said that there's over 7 billion people that are on the earth right now. And researchers tell us that amongst the 7 billion people, on average, as you go through the course of your life, you will come to know about 600 people. And of those 600 people, I would ask you, how many do you know personally? I'm not asking you how many do you know on social media that you've sat there and posted back and forth, but I want to know how many people do you know intimately? They know your fears, they know your concerns, they know your worries, they know your dreams, and not only do they know yours, but you know theirs as well. I would imagine that most of us in this room probably could count on our hands the people that fit that category. But besides the vastness of the world, another reason why we often wonder if our life has significance because of the stage of life that we're in. See, if you're a young person here, and I remember those days, you're looking forward to your life. What, is my li what am I supposed to do with my life? How do I know if I do this job, there's going to be any value or meaning? Will my life really make any difference if I go this path? And so you're wrestling in your mind saying, am I really going to make a difference whenever I get older? Maybe you're in middle age. and You're not looking back or forward. You're looking presently where you're at. And you're saying, you know what? I thought my life was going to be so much different than what it is right now. And you're wrestling saying, I wish things were different than the way they were because I thought these great, great dreams. And look at where I'm at right now. Or maybe you're in the older stage of life and you're looking back and you're saying, man, time and life goes by so fast. And now you're asking the question, does my life really matter anymore? Can I really contribute? Would people even care if I'm still around tomorrow? But it is those two realities of life, the greatness of this world and the fact that we're all in stages of life trying to figure things out, that often we ask that question, does my life have significance or meaning? And it's the backdrop of that very important question that Psalms 139 shaped. Because it's a powerful passage that reminds us, despite how great this world is, and despite what phase of life you're in right now, there's some truths about God that we can hold on to. And the first is God has a knowledge about your situation. And not only does he have a knowledge about your situation, but he's presently involved in it. But even more powerfully than that, in the mix of those seven plus billion people, God knows each of us personally. To him, you're not just another person in the crowd, but you have been uniquely created with purpose and value. And so I want to read the whole chapter of Psalm 139 to set what we're going to be talking about this week and next week, but I want to give you a backdrop of what this psalm is all about, because it's an example of a thanksgiving psalm. It was written by King David. We've talked a lot about King David, the man for God's own heart. And in this psalm, he's writing in a a psalm that's expressing his thankfulness for his personal relationship with God. Maybe you've done that similar. Maybe on, on Valentine's Day or for someone's birthday, you write a letter to tell them how much you've meant to me and what you mean in my life. And here's David laying out to God the, the, the personal intimacy of his relationship with him. And what I love what David does, he describes this relationship by taking certain theological truths about God and then applies them to his life. You see, David does something we need to do in our lives. He doesn't just say, okay, I understand who God is. He says, God, because I know who you are, I'm going to apply it to my life. He does an elegant job of it, and it's so powerful because what? by doing this, David's perception of himself is, not rooted in his, uh, is rooted within his understanding of who God is. Did you hear what I said? How David saw himself was in relationship to who God was. That's got to be transforming. Because most of you today are defining who you are based upon what culture says you should be or what by what other people say you should be. But David shows us something so powerful that we need to define ourselves by who God is. And we need to reclaim a biblical understanding of God because right now, if you don't have one, it'll impact the way that you live your life. If today you see God as an authoritarian parent, you will walk in constant fear of judgment that God is ready to end your life. And what David shows us is so powerful that if you can reclaim a biblical understanding of God and apply it to your life, it'll transform the way you see yourself and the way you live. So it's with that backdrop that I want to read the entire chapter of Psalm 139. So please read along with me. It says the following, O Lord, 
You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even be a four, a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there you shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light about me be night, even it, the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you. For you form my, my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. But search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I really believe that if you take to heart what David is sharing in this psalm over the next two weeks, it will really transform the way that you see God and the way that you live your life. Because what David does in his very first five verses, he lays out something that we know as God's omniscience. That's just a great word to say that God is all-knowing. And so David opens up by laying out what this means to his life. In verse 1, he says the following. He says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. And I love how David opens this up because what does David acknowledge in the very first verse? That God has a personal knowledge of him. That's how he set, shapes it. Not God, you are some distant being, but he says, God, you, you searched me and you know me. You have a personal awareness of who I am. And so he starts off by saying, you have searched me. That Hebrew word for searched is powerful because it means to examine intensely. Some of you here can remember the joys of going to your annual doctor's visit, right? You just love going there because your doctor's going to check you from head to toe and let you know what your health status is. Just like a doctor does that for you physically, what is David saying that God has done for him? God has given a full and comprehensive examination of him and his life. And besides saying you have searched me, he goes, you know me. And that Hebrew word for know is not an intellectual knowledge like you may know, you know, weather today. What it means is it's, a, it's an intimate or personal knowledge. So what David is opening up in this very powerful psalm, he's starting off with this idea that God personally knows him completely and fully. In other words, there is nothing about David that is hidden from God. And that's powerful because what do we do all the time? All of us are guilty of that fact that we hide who we truly are from others. We don't want people to see our hurts. We don't want to see people to see our pains and our shortcomings. So what do we do? We try to hide them and only give people what we're willing to share with them. That's why social media is so popular, right? I can post anything I want. I can be whoever I want hide behind that screen. No one really knows who I truly am. And maybe for you right now, this idea that God knows everything about you is a little bit intimidating, but to me, it's freeing. Because to have a relationship with somebody that says, I know you so well that when you come to me, BJ, you don't have to hide who you are. You can come to me honestly, genuinely, and broken before me, and I am there to be there for you. That's what we have with God. We don't have to hide who we are because he knows everything about us. We can go to him and be genuine and honest with him about who we truly are. Then David moves on from verse 1 to verse 2 and 3, and this is what he says. He goes, you know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. What David wants to do is besides the fact that God knows him, he wants to lay out the extent of how God knows him. And so he begins to start laying out this extent by saying, first of all, you know my daily activities. 
He says, you know when I rise up and when I sit down. In other words, God, he's saying, God, you know the insignificant things of my life, the things that don't matter to anybody else and no one even pays attention, you know every single one of them. And not only do you know about my daily activity, but you can discern or understand my very thoughts. And you also search out my path. That search is a powerful word, and maybe if you're a farmer, you can fully understand this because it refers to a farmer who would go out and separate wheat from the chaff. And what he's saying about God searching his path, he said, just like a farmer goes out to separate the wheat from the chaff, what is valuable with what is not valuable, he says, God, you search my life, you search for the decisions that I make, and you separate what is valuable to me and what is not valuable to me. And right now, if we know that right now God is evaluating all of our lives, and he's saying, look, this is valuable, this is not, should it not make us step back and reflect upon the decisions and the path that we're on right now? It makes me think of the fact that we need to watch We need to be mindful of what we watch, listen to, and read. Yes, we do. Especially behind closed doors when no one's around. Because if I know that God is searching my path, that even behind closed doors when no one's there, and God knows exactly what I'm watching, what I'm reading, what I'm listening to, then I need to ask myself, God, is this decision right now? What I'm watching, what am I listening to? Is it drawing me closer to you? Is it taking me on a path that gets me closer to Christ? Or is it pulling me away? I love what... Paul says in Philippians 4, because it speaks so much about this. He says this in verse 8 and 9. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And as God is once again searching our path, what does David close in verse 3 with? You are acquainted with all my ways. That means you know my strengths, you know my weaknesses, you know how I respond to certain situations. And the more I was reading about this, I'm thinking, man, it sounds a lot like my wife, right? She knows a lot about me. But what is David saying? He says, God, you know me better than I know myself. And for us, the application is God knows you better than you know yourself. And David goes on in verse 4, and he says this, Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. I mean, he's saying, God, not only do you know what I'm going to say, you know before I even say it. And he's not just talking about the words that you're going to say. You know what this means? God is saying, I not only know what you're going to say tomorrow, what you're going to say next week, but I know the tensions behind why you said it. A commentary that I read explained this way. Even before the hidden thoughts of the mind or secret intentions of the heart are translated into communicative language, the Lord knows and understands it all. And right now, if we know that God knows what we're not just going to say today, but we're going to say tomorrow, should it not make us really think more deeply about what comes out of our mouth? Because out of our mouth can come things that bless others or can curse others. We can speak things that are wholesome and edifying, or we can speak things that are destructive. I think what Paul says in Colossians 4, 6, he says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. In other words, let our words be a blessing to have a purifying effect on those around us. Then he goes on in verse 5. Really, I think it's a powerful verse. He says, You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. What he's saying is, God, not only do you know every detail of my life, but you know what's best for my life. You see that word hemmed, and I don't know what your translation uses there, but a better way to say it is that God has placed a barrier of protection around David. It's a military term. It's like a fortification. And so what David is saying, God, is that you have protected me. In other words, what God is not, God, he's saying is, God, before something comes into my life, it has to get past you first. That's powerful, isn't it, to know that right now God has placed a fortification around your life. But here's the challenge for all of us. Do we choose right now to say, God, I will yield my life to know because you know what's best for me, or will I choose to do it my own way? Because, yes, we live in a fallen world and we experience difficulty, but sometimes in our lives, you know why we're facing difficulty? Because we said, God, I think I know it better than you. So we step outside that protective barrier he's given us to guide our lives. And we've got to decide right now that, God, we will surrender to the fortification, to the boundaries that you have created because you know what's best for me. And besides the fact that God says you hem me in, he goes on to say this, that you laid your hand upon me. 
which he's expressing about God's loving care for him. I mean, think about when someone just puts their hand on you. There's a sense of just a warmness about it, right? In most cases, it should be. And when I was reading this, I thought about Jesus. About how Jesus was there and the crowds were following him. And some parents decided to bring their kids to Jesus. Which was very common back then because that's what you did for a rabbi or teacher. You wanted the rabbi or teacher to bless the children. But what's the disciples' response? Get them out of here. In other words, Jesus is too busy for these people. He's got more important things to do. And Jesus steps in and says, hey. He rebukes the disciples. He said, let the little children come unto me. Then it says in Mark chapter 10, verses 16. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. What a powerful imagery. And what we take out of here is whether it was David or these children, God is the one who cares for us and desires for us to come with him with our needs. This past week, I was with someone and we were talking about the conversation that we had this past week about when does life begin? And he said, you know what? He goes, I just feel like sometimes in my life, God is just too busy for me. He doesn't care about me. And I looked at him and I'll look at you guys right now and I said, look at God is not too busy for you. God loves and desires to hear from us. He is there not only to hear, but he is there to take on our burdens. He's there to walk us through our struggles and our fears. And David got that because as we're going to see, David's life was not just perfect life. He knew the ups and the downs of life and he understood God, no matter what I'm going to go through, I know that you know me and that you are there for me. What a powerful, what a powerful reminder to us. And so what is David's conclusion about God's knowledge? Great conclusion from a man who knew God's, who was considered to have God, a heart after God. It says this, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I love his humbleness here. He's like, God, I cannot figure you out, and I'm not going to try to figure you out. You're beyond my mind. What a beautiful conclusion, because what do we often do in our lives? We often try to define God by how we want God to be. We say, God, this is what I want you to do for my life. This is how I want you to be. This is what I think about you. And David recognized you're supp- you far surpass my limited knowledge about you. And there's a theological point about what David's saying here. And here's the theological point, that God has perfect knowledge. God is not like you and I who every day have to go out there and learn new things about life and learn new things about us. That's not God. He's on the process of learning. He already knows. And not only does he not have to learn like we do, his knowledge is beyond what we can comprehend. And so if I understand that theological point, what's the practical point for my life right now? It's very clear that you're going to go through life, you're going to have experiences in life where you will not always know why God is allowing something to happen. Did you hear what I said? You're going to go through it and you're not going to know why. And it is by far the greatest question that I get as a pastor is one word, why? Why did I lose my loved one? Why is my child no longer here? Why do I have to go through this uh, health crisis? Why did I lose my job? All these whys begin to prompt yourself up and people look at me and say, can you please tell me why? And you know what? I'm not God. I'm like David. I'm like, God, you're far surpass my knowledge. One person who learned this lesson very well was a guy by the name of Job. Because if you read through Job, and that'd be a great study one of these days, but Job's sitting around with his friends and they all thought they could figure out God. They could all explain to Job, you want to know why you're going through problems and pain and suffering? Well, here's this solution. Here's this reason. Here's this reason. And then finally, God reveals himself to Job. And this is how Job responds. This is chapter 42, verse 1 through 3. He says, I know that you can do all things, that no purpose of yours can be thwarted or stopped. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. In other words, God, I am sorry that I tried to figure you out because you are far surpassed my knowledge. The challenge then for us is like Job or David or whatever, when we're confronted with the uncertainty of life, we have to move forward with what is certain. And what is certain is that we serve a God who not only knows why you're going through what you're going through, but says, I will personally walk you through it. That's the certainty of it. Then David moves on from God's knowledge to the fact that God is all present. And we'll just add another little theological term to your vocabulary, which means omnipresence. He's going to unpack, what does this mean that God's all present in verse 7 through 12? This is what he says in verse 7. He goes, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? In other words, what David is saying is that I, I cannot hide from your presence, God. Your presence is all-encompassing. 
And if you guys remember, we learned about this in the life of Jonah, didn't we? Jonah thought, okay, God, you want me to go this way? I'm going to go this way, and somehow I can get away from you, right? And we saw that Jonah could not flee from the presence of God. Now, when David's life, in the context of what he's talking about, he's not talking about him fleeing from God's presence. What he's talking about is his comfort in knowing that God's presence was a consistent reality in his life. But I want you to understand this. If you only grasp this point, you've missed what David's talking about. Because you might be like, okay, I understand about God's presence in my life. But that's not what David's getting to. David just didn't acknowledge that God's presence was in his life. David desired God's presence. David says in Psalm 63, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That's my question for you. Is not just do you know if God's presence is in your life, but do you desire his presence? Because David's very clear. It's like a man, I'm walking through a desert. I am so thirsty that I can't survive without a glass of water. David is saying, that's how I feel about your presence, God, because I know how life is. I know it's difficult. I know it can beat me down. But no matter what, God, I need to have your presence in my life. And do you have David's heart? Do you desire his presence like David did? It's one thing to know it's there. It's another thing to desire it. And David desired it. And so what David then does, in light of the fact that God is all present, he begins to express different places he could go and still find God's presence. So this is what he says in verse 8 and 9. He says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. He's talking about the skies that are up in the, uh, up in the air. He goes, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Sheol was the realm of the dead. And what David is saying is I can go to these extreme places. In both places, what? I'm going to find God's presence. In other words, there's no direction I can go up or down. I'm still going to experience God's presence. Then he goes off in verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, what is David saying here? That figure, that, that phrase, wings of the morning, is a phrase of speech that we use all the time in modern language. What David is talking about is the speed of light. And so David is saying as the morning sunlight comes, like the speed of light, which is much more than we can fathom with their own eyes, he goes, it cannot outrun your presence. Did you hear what I said? The speed of light cannot outrun God's presence. And not only that, David goes on to say, even in the depths of the sea, God, your presence will still be there. The ocean, they tell us on average, is about two miles deep. At its height, they say the, the greatest depth is over six miles. But the power of the ocean is we haven't even navigated half of the ocean. And here's David saying, no matter what part of the ocean I may find myself, you are still there. And guess who learned that lesson? Jonah. He understood the depths of the ocean, God was still present. Then we go on to verse 10 and 12. And just like David did with God's knowledge, what does David do? He draws conclusions about God's presence for his life. And I want to stop right here. Please understand, I can give you guys a great theological lesson about God's presence and God's knowledge and God's goodness, but it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't translate to changing the way that you live. David shows us that who God is is one thing, but applying that to my life is another thing. So we have to apply these truths, and that's what he does. And he says this, even there you shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. That means even in there, in heaven, in Sheol, as the the light comes into the morning, as I go to the depths of the sea, you are there to lead and hold me. When David says your hand shall lead me, he's saying that you're going to direct my steps to avoid going the wrong direction. I should get a couple of amens out of that because you know what God does. God says, if you step off where I want you to be, you step out where I've hemmed you in. As a loving father, I will discipline you and draw you back. But he goes on to say, my right hand shall hold me. Right hand is a sign of strength and power. What David is saying is that, God, I know that when I go through the difficulties of life, your hand will strengthen me. You'll help me get through it. David has shown us something so powerful about God. He is not some disinterested person watching us go through life fumbling around, right? He is saying, God, you are actively involved in leading me and caring for me. You see why David lived his life differently? Why was a man after God's own heart? Because he knew who God was. And when he knew who God was, it transferred the way or transformed the way that he lived his life. Then he goes on in verse 11 and 12. He says, if I say... Surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. 
The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. David here is describing how God's presence is like a constant light in the darkness. And we have all experienced moments of darkness, haven't we? We have all been moments where it's like, God, I don't even see the foot, my foot in front of me. How do I move forward? And what David is saying, and David was a man who experienced some very tragic moments, losing children, having his one son try to kill him, having all these people that rose up against him to destroy his life. David said, even in those moments of darkness, guess what, God? Your, your presence is so powerful that in darkness, your light shines through the darkness. I was just talking to somebody the other day, and they lost power with the storm that we had. A little bit challenging, especially when you have younger kids, right? Trying to figure out how to get to the bathroom, how to get this. And it doesn't even matter in the darkness of that, the house that they were in, God's presence still shines through. It's the power of what David's talking about. And did David believe this? Yeah, he did. Because there were many moments in David's life where the darkness of his life was so difficult. And one of them was in Psalm 18. Enemies had risen up to destroy David. And this is what David says in chapter 18, verse 28. He says, For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. And right now, you may be going through a dark time. But I'm going to tell you something right now about the God that we serve. That darkness cannot withstand his presence. And he will bring light into that situation. Hold on and trust him. Because that's the God that we serve. David has taken us through just a beautiful picture of God's knowledge and presence and how it applies to his life. And so I want to leave with this concluding thought. What I hope you guys can walk away from, it's very simple. God knows what you are going through and is present in it. Now, many of you might say amen and say, hey, preach it, brother. But you know what the challenge is right now? We may know, but it is very hard to apply that. It is one thing to know, God, I know you're, you, you don't know everything. I know that you're present everywhere, but man, there are difficulties and challenges in my life, and it does not seem to be that way. And so when those moments come up, we all ask questions, and guess what? You've asked these, and so have I. And here's the first question. God, why are you allowing this to happen? Come on, we've all asked that. God, why? Really? Why are you letting this go on? And here's the second question. God, where are you? We have all asked God, where are you? Because I just don't feel that you're present. And David, the man who wrote Psalm 139, you know what? He asked those very same questions. Because in Psalm 13, he was going through a very difficult time. He experienced loneliness and he experienced despair. And in verse 1, he raises a question that all of us ask, have asked and will ask in our lives. And this is what he says. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? This man who wrote Psalm 139, he's going through a difficult time, and even he understood, God, I just feel like your face is so far away from me. I feel like you don't hear my voice. But the power of David was he had this intimate, personal relationship with God, and because of that, that's not the end of the psalm. Because we go to verse 5 and 6 and listen to the power of David. Listen to what he says about the God that he serves, because what he did is he told us something very clear. I will not define my God through the circumstances. I will define my circumstances by the God that I serve. And so he says this in verse 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Like David, when we have a relationship with God, we can have confidence that in the unknown moments of our lives, those why moments which we're all going to have, that we can know that it is not unknown to God. Right now, you are broken right now, and you're saying, I'm going through a why moment, and I don't know why, but you know what? The God that you serve says, I know what's going on, and don't worry, i got a plan and a purpose for this. And like David, when we have a relationship with God, we can have confidence that when we feel abandoned and alone, and we have, many of us have felt abandoned and alone, we have asked the God, where are you questions? But in the midst of that, we can know like David that God is right beside us, that his presence in the midst of that dark moment in our lives is shining brightly through and showing us the way that we can keep going forward. But there's a profound question I have to close with today. And the profound question that I want to ask you and even myself is not whether God knows you. We know that. We saw David pour his heart out. And what has David showed us? Amongst the 7 billion people out in this world, he knows you personally and intimately. So what's the profound question then? Do you know him? 
Do you know him like David? Do you yearn? Do you desire to know him? And that's why the reality is this. We always end with the cross. That's why there's a cross behind me and a cross in front of me. And the reason why this, the cross is the focal point of this church, because it's the focal point of our relationship. Because if there's a moment in my life where I start to say, God, I don't know why. God, I don't know where. The cross is a reminder that, guess what? This God loved you so much that he came to this earth and said, I will give my life for you. You don't have to carry this burden on your own. That I will be there with you and walk you through this. What a powerful thing. And so I hope today, not only you walk out of this room saying, God, thank you that you know me, but you can walk away like David with confidence as you face the trials and difficulties of life and say, God, I know you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.